Today's reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male nor female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male nor female servants, his oxen or ass, or anything be that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Friends, God is still speaking. May our hearts remain open to listen and understand. Would you pray with me, please? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your presence. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It feels right on a day like today to return to the fundamentals. It feels right on a day like today after a week like this week, after a year like this year, to be reminded of what is deep and abiding and true, of what is the grounding of our faith, the foundation on which we are to build our relationships and our lives. Now, full disclosure, I chose this reading for this week months ago. Of course, I knew that November 8th would be the Sunday after the election, but I had no idea, none of us did, exactly what shape this week would have taken. I didn't know if today would be about celebration or lamentation or complicated in between, whether there would be lawsuits in the courts or violence in the streets or hanging chads again but it feels right today. We turn to these fundamental instructions given by God to the Israelites in the Sinai wilderness, instructions that would guide them as they learned how to be a new kind of community together, how to live in right relationship with God and with one another. That's what 
we are still trying to learn today. It feels right to be reminded of who God is at God's very core. We, as the reading began, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God is most essentially a liberator. God is most essentially concerned for the suffering of God's people who are oppressed, pushed to the margins by the earthly powers that be. God is active and at work, calling forth courage from ordinary people and raising up leaders who will guide the people out of bondage. And there is no person, no power, no system that can stand in the way of God's inexorable movement toward justice. Work bends slowly sometimes, but bend it does. Whenever we see barriers broken that used to hold some of God's people back. Whenever we see a, a broadening of who counts as us, you can be sure that the spirit of God is alive. It feels right to be reminded also of the dangers of idolatry, of trying to turn stone or gold or flesh and blood into divinity. Anytime we prioritize wealth over well-being, profits over people, our efforts are not aligned with God. And anytime we choose our own comfort over someone else's survival, we have missed the boat. Anytime we attempt to immobilize the living God in the form of a stationary statue, an old document, a particular policy, it is like trying to stop the movement of the ocean. Anytime we elevate a human leader to the position of savior, we are in trouble. Whether that person is Moses or Aaron or Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or Stacey Abrams, no single individual human being can ever live up to all that we project onto them. And when we put one person on a pedestal, when we make them larger than life, we diminish ourselves and our own power. And we deny the truth that human flourishing is always a collective effort that each of us is implicated in the work, that every one of us has a role to play. And anytime we make an idol of our illusions and cling to what we wish were true, we lose the chance to join with God in transforming what is into what could be. If we insist that America is a place where anyone who works hard can get ahead, we lose the opportunity to dismantle the systems that trap people in generational poverty while enriching the 1%. If we insist that America is truly the land of equality, if we take the election's results as a sign that race and gender are no longer factors that shape a person's chances in this country, we lose the opportunity to unmask the ways in which white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity and ableism have been built into the structures of this nation from the beginning and are continuing to punish children for the sins of our ancestors. If instead we take a clear eyed look at the realities revealed by this apocalyptic season in which we're living, then we just might have a chance to notice where God is breaking in and to join with God to help this nation truly embody the aspirational values of its founding, to make this country and this world new. It feels right to be reminded that if we say God bless America without also saying God bless Honduras, God bless El Salvador, God bless Syria and Somalia and Myanmar and all the nations that were not that long ago dismissed with an offensive epithet. If we say God save the queen, God save the president, if we invoke God's blessing on the ones who hold power without also praying a blessing for the ones who clean the floors and harvest the food and wash the dishes and empty the bedpans, if we forget that God cannot be domesticated, that God is beyond our comprehension and certainly beyond our control, then we are much more apt to offend God's sensibilities than we are with a bit of cussing. It feels right to be reminded that no matter how important the work, rest 
is a sacred thing. The Sabbath is not to be profaned. That we are human beings, not human doings. That we are not meant for work alone, but also for delight, for play, for relationship. That our labor does not define us. That we are not in this thing all by ourselves, that no matter how much it might sometimes feel like it, it actually does not all depend on us. And that if we have built or participated in systems in which our siblings, our neighbors, or we ourselves cannot afford to stop and rest without losing homes or leaving children hungry, then these systems are of Pharaoh and not of God. It feels right to be reminded that our relationships with our siblings and our neighbors should have their root in perceiving and honoring the image of God in the ones around us. That anything we say or do that disparages the divine likeness in any of God's children is not consistent with the call of our faith. And it's not limited to explicit murder as such words or deeds, actions or policies that diminish the lives or the bodies or the souls of certain groups of people while privileging others are also in opposition to God's command. For every member of God's family deserves to be honored. Every child of God deserves to live a full and flourishing life. Every neighbor deserves to have access to the rights and resources they need. It feels right on a day like today, after a week like this week, after a year like this year, to be reminded of what is deep and abiding and true, of what is the grounding of our faith, the foundation on which we are to build our relationships and our lives, that foundation which Jesus rephrased in what we call the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. For regardless of the final margins in the battleground states or the results of the recounts or the fate of the electoral college, the commandment to establish new ways of being community together to live in right relationship with God and with our neighbors, to love God with all that we are and our neighbors as ourselves, to place our faith in God alone, and to remember that God is a living, loving, and liberating God. This commandment remains true. Of course it matters who is in the White House, who is on Capitol Hill, who is on the Supreme Court. It matters tremendously who our leaders are and what kind of integrity they do or don't have. In fact, the prophets of our scriptures have a lot to say about the consequences when leaders neglect their sacred duty to pursue justice and to care for the most vulnerable in society. It matters tremendously what values our fe fellow citizens espoused as they voted. It matters tremendously whose identities are or are not represented in the halls of power. But regardless of the final outcome of the election, our work as the people of God continues to bind up the wounded, to comfort those who mourn, to set the captives free, to overturn the tables of oppression and exclusion, to hope in things not yet seen, to put our faith in the love that changes everything and to be co-creators with God, building up a realm of joy and justice for all people and for all creation, regardless of the final outcome of this or any election. We know that God's grace endures. God's mercy abounds. God's justice persists. God's call summons. And God's love is even now making all things new. Amen. Mm -hmm.